Sometimes when I get invited to present someone, a speaker, at one of these meetings, I don't really know the person very well, and I'm not really sure what to say. I suppose it's sometimes like a, a preacher at a funeral who knows the person was a scoundrel and is trying not to uh, upset the, the, the family too much with what they say about him. But this man, it is truly a privilege for me to introduce him because I, I sense a, a brotherhood, a kinship with him, a, a common goal and interest with our lives. I first met uh, Joel Fink in Cope, Colorado, and I've got to see a show of hands here of how many people have spent a day and a night in Cope, Colorado. Wow! <laughs> That's way more than I thought there would be. <laughs> but Cope, Colorado, of course, has had a Grace Church for many, many years. And it used to be the home of Things to Come Mission. And I was born to uh, Vernon and Darlene Anderson, who were in Things to Come Mission. But the first time I met Joel and Linda, they, uh, they were pastoring that church, Cope Community Church. And I was just beginning my missionary work. It was one of the first churches that actually invited me to come and speak. And I was just really encouraged by this couple, this family now. Uh, if I can think of, of a word to describe Joel, I would have to say integrity. He's a complete whole. What he says is the way he lives. I don't see uh, any divisions in his life between his statements and his walk. He's... Perhaps the, the claim to fame here, I, I, I don't know if Joel wants to be remembered this way, but I have a feeling that he's going to be remembered for a long time for this book. Have any of you read this book? I think you all have. If you haven't, read it. I believe every grace believer in the world should read this book. Um, I have to tell Pastor Sadler that Things to Come Mission used to send things that differ out always. All of our pastors have to read and answer the question in Things that Differ. They still have to do that. But I have to tell you that this book is starting to give that one some competition. Um, we're starting to send out more and more copies of this. We order this by the case and send it overseas. But one, one thing, if you read through this, you'll, you'll feel Joel's heart. At the end of every chapter of this book, what does he include? A plea for salvation. And that's his heart, that people will get saved, that they'll come to know Jesus Christ. And every chapter, just uh, if you just look through it at random, he, um, he says, the beauty of the gospel of this dispensation and others is that the ticket is free. And then he goes on into, into explaining the gospel that people can receive. Um, another chapter, do you have that hope? Paul calls the rapture a blessed hope. Why? Because this is something we're looking forward to. And then he goes into explaining the gospel and asking the people if they have received Christ as their Savior. And that's what his life is about. Later on, he went to South Dakota. And I didn't actually meet him in you in that church, but I did go to the church. And it was, it's a beautiful log cabin building there. But I know while he was there, a good friend of mine, Genesis Marat, came and visited them. And uh, he was telling me the other day that Genesis came up to him and said, how old are you, Joel? And Joel said, about oh, 45. Genesis says, I think you can still plant four or five more churches in your lifetime. <laughs> Within about two years, he turned the church over to another pastor, and he went to a place, a town that had no Grace Church with his whole family, and he started planting a Grace Church. This is what we need. I wish we had more men. I wish we had a hundred Joel Finks in our, in our Grace Fellowship that we could... Uh, <laughs> no? <Yeah. laughs> I, I have to say that uh, one great thing about Joel is he has a sense of humor too. He has on the back of this book, he lists some very serious titles here. Lordship, Salvation, Gems of Truth. Uh, we come to advanced questions about the Grace message. And then we have a book called The Return of Gapasaurus Rex. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't know if the sense of humor is in the title or that he actually thinks he's going to convince us of this, uh, the, uh, the, 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 no, no. 
the, the non-young earth theory there or something. I, I, at first I thought it was a, a children's book, but uh, when I read it I realized uh, he was actually trying to convince us of this thing. But, <laughs> but no, Joel is someone you can, even if there's an area you might disagree, you'll still love him, he'll still love you, and I, that kind of a spirit we really need, where we can actually have differences of opinion uh, about the Bible, and yet we still love one another and can work together. So I'd like to ask uh, Joel Fink uh, to come up, and I'd like to pray for him before he speaks to Thanks. us. Our precious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the ministry of this man. I thank you for his heart for the lost. I thank you for his desire to plant churches in areas where there is no church preaching the gospel of the grace of God. And I would ask that your spirit would be upon him, fill him, give him the strength, give him clarity of mind, help him to speak to us exactly the message that you've given for him today. Bless his ministry, bless his family, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Ben, and you're right, you do not know him very well. But let's leave it like that. Please take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we open the bread of life, that you would enlighten the eyes of our understanding so that we might know the wonderful hope of your calling, that we might understand your calling and the wonderful riches of grace that we have in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. The title of my message this morning is not a trick. Evangelizing the saved. What I do not mean by this title is evangelizing those who think they're saved. Someone else has already covered that. I believe it is possible to be saved and still need to be saved. What do I mean by this? As I've studied the Word of God, I've found many places where the word salvation doesn't refer to our salvation from the penalty of sin at all. I first came to this realization as I studied the Old Testament. And I love the Old Testament. How many of you love the Old Testament? What a wonderful piece of divinely inspired literature. And as I studied more and more in the Old Testament, I found that uh, many, perhaps most of the times, when it's talking about being saved, it's talking about being delivered from an enemy, being delivered from some kind of a problem. Perhaps a classic example is Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 20, where it says, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and what? We are not saved. And it's talking there about the coming Babylonian invasion when Israel was falling into idolatry and they realized, some of them at least, through Jeremiah and others, that the handwriting was literally coming to the wall, wasn't it, in that instance, and uh, they were going to be uh, taken into captivity. And every year it got nearer and nearer, and the summer passed, the harvest was ended, and they still weren't saved, were they? They weren't delivered. But I found that the Apostle Paul also uses the word saved or salvation in a very similar fashion. And an example of that came up in one of the questions which Pastor Sadler thankfully answered correctly. <laughs> if you were here, you'll notice I whispered in his ear before he went up. <laughs> and I've had this question posed to me when it says in verse number 2 of 1 Corinthians 15, by which also ye are saved if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you unless ye have believed in vain. It almost sounds like Paul is saying you're saved if you keep doing something. And I say that sounds more like the kingdom gospel, doesn't it? And you'll find that all over the place in Peter, James, and John. But why is Paul saying it? And the answer is, he isn't talking here about our soul's salvation. He took care of that in verse 1. When he said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Can you get any more saved than that? No, that's it. You are, you are in a standing with God. 
And then he goes on, by which also ye are being saved. There's a continual process of salvation now for the child of God. And I want to propose to you this morning that the greatest hindrance to evangelism of the lost is the abandonment of key biblical principles by the saved. And don't we see that throughout Scripture? When Christ came to the earth, did he come to just save everybody? No, he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why? Because they were the chosen instrument of God's evangelistic program in that day. And so in order to carry that out, he needed to come to them and, and get them in the right relationship with God so that they might go out and do the work that they should. I find that there are four key areas where the Apostle Paul uses the word saved or salvation in this other sense. And in doing so, he is telling the saints that they need to be saved. They need to be delivered from something which is greatly hindering their ability to be the evangelistic tool that they should be. So indeed, today we are going to talk about evangelizing the saved. And the first area that I see that we need to evangelize is that believers need to be delivered from their futile lifestyles. And that's what we find here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. They need to be delivered from their futile lifestyles. Verse number 2, by which also ye are saved, you're continually being saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And then he goes on and he gives us the gospel. Now I use this passage, as you well know, for the gospel message. That's where we find it. There is the definition of the gospel for this dispensation. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. But did you know that that same gospel message is also the message which empowers you to live the Christian life? How many of you knew that? Why is that so? Because, I'm not turning there, and you don't need to either, but in Romans 6, where the Apostle Paul elaborates on this very gospel message, what does he say? He says that we are dead with Christ, that we have been buried with him by baptism into death, and that we have been raised to new life. And you know, even as a grace believer, I used to stop in my application of that passage two-thirds of the way through when it came to our sanctification. And where I stopped was, here's how, you, here's how you stop sinning. You realize that you're dead to sin, and you realize that you've been buried with Christ. And I would, I would have these great illustrations. Do dead men sin? What's the answer? No, okay, dead men don't sin. I used to leave it there. But we're missing the most important part there, aren't we? We are to be alive unto God. And that's where the resurrection comes in. And that's where the Apostle Paul gets so excited in Philippians, where he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Not that I've already attained, but this one thing I do. Someone's already preached that one. I'm not going to. I've got some more important things to talk about today. <laughs> But what was it that the Corinthians were buying into? They were buying into this theory that there was no resurrection from the dead. And so the apostle is simply showing them the futility of life if you're going to hold to that doctrine. And he summarizes it later on in the chapter in verse number 33. He says, be not, or verse 32, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And this is the philosophy which the church has adopted, by and large. Now, he's not necessarily, you know, when we hear that, uh, you know, let us eat or drink, or like when the Lord said that in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. We usually think of, you know, drunken festivals and, and all kinds of debauchery, which that was going on in the days of Noah. I'm not saying it wasn't. But that's not the point of that statement. The point of that statement is they were just going about their everyday activities and all of a sudden here comes the flood and they weren't expecting it. 
And likewise, the church today, believers in Christ, by and large, are just going about their daily activities. They're eating and drinking, and tomorrow they die. And for all intents and purposes, they've accomplished nothing in the way of bringing lost souls to Christ. We need to be delivered from that. Do we not? We need to be saved from futile lifestyles. Secondly, believers need to be delivered from fleshly ministries. Believers need to be delivered from fleshly ministries. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. And here's a passage, I'm sorry to do this, but I'm going to take away one of your evangelism passages concerning the lost. And I'm sure we can still draw the application and the principle. But I've used this time and time again, as many of you have as well. Verse number 2 of 2 Corinthians 6. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I secured thee. Now behold is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And how many times have we thundered that? Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be too late. And that's true, is it not? But that's not what he's getting at here in this passage. Look at the context. Do we still do that? <laughs> Verse 1. We then as what? Workers. Workers together with him beseech ye also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. There he goes again. <laughs> Is he saying, well, you got saved and it might be in vain because you might lose it and it was all in vain. No, he's not, that's not what he's saying. He's saying the same thing he said back in 1 Corinthians 15. He's saying, now that you've trusted Christ and you received the grace of God for your salvation, when it comes to you being a worker, don't receive that grace in vain. What has God provided us with in order to serve him? What is it? Grace. Grace saves, but grace equips. And now he's telling them, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I secured thee. You know, I did a really, a really strange thing. I looked up the Old Testament passage where this came from. And did you know the Apostle Paul had a method to his madness when he quoted some of these? Did you realize that? <laughs> Go back there. Go to Isaiah chapter 49. Now let's just see what he's talking about back there. The context, of course, is the nation of Israel. And what was their job? They were to be a blessing to the world. Just as God had called Abraham, they were to be a blessing to the world. How were they doing by the time of Isaiah? Oh boy, they were doing about like the church is, right? They weren't doing well at all. And in Isaiah chapter 49, look at verse number 1. It says, Listen, O isles, unto me. Hearken, ye people, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother. Hath he made mention of my name? He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Excuse me. Why do, uh, uh, why do faucets go drip, drip, drip? You know, because they can't go. Verse number two continues. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. Now, take that away in your mind. We won't need it till the third point. But in verse three, he says, And said unto me, Thou art my what? Servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. Oh boy, where did we get that? Where, where did we hear that before? I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work uh, with my God. Well, let's go on down to the verse. We're, we can't spend too much time on this. Verse number uh, 6, halfway through. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. Was that not Israel's purpose? To be a light to the Gentiles? That thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord. 
the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. And at this point, Israel is thinking, uh, us? You're going, there's a way you can use us to be your servant? It looked utterly impossible, didn't it? Look at how they had failed God and they had broken the covenant and they were turning to idolatry. And it's in that context where God is reminding them of their purpose on earth. That he says in verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, in an accepted time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I, what? Helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, and to cause to inherit the desolate heritage. Now obviously, Paul does not draw that entire application. Because he realizes that's not our mission to inhabit the earth and to get all the nations in line. That's not our job. But the principle is the same. When you are facing the ministry and you feel like you are just totally inept, useless, unable to go on, good for nothing, what does God say to us in 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2? For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have... Now here's the, here's the, uh, the Greek, or the translation from the Greek... Succured thee. What does that mean? Help. Help. <laughs> I think they should have stuck with that. <laughs> I have helped thee. If you decide that you as a believer do want to serve the Lord, will the Lord deliver you from a futile life and help you do that? Yes. Amen. Yes, he will. Do Christians today need to be saved in this sense? Amen. Yes, they do. Look at 2 Corinthians. What is our problem? We need to be delivered from fleshly ministries. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 1. Now I, Paul, myself, <laughs> he wants to make sure you know who he is. I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ in, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present, with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. You know, some people looked at Paul's boldness in the Lord and they said, oh, look at him, he's proud, he's walking around, he thinks he's somebody. And Paul says, no, that's, that's not what this is. That's not what it's about. It's not a matter of the flesh. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We need to be delivered from fleshly ministries. And I have been traveling this fall and almost every place I go, I hear the same lament from grace churches, especially the newer churches that are really working to grow. And they say we're, we're having to compete with the seeker church movement. I didn't even know what that was till well, not too long ago. Well, we had a better name for it back in Bible Institute. We called it the New Evangelicalism. That sounds, uh, I don't know, nobody knows what that is either anymore. The seeker church movement, who was it, Dick, the church in town there, that uh, we will not make anyone uncomfortable. What's the job of the preacher? You want me to do that again? <laughs> the job of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's our job. It's our job description. There's a church in Fort Wayne, Indiana, founded by a man, I think everyone, and I'll give his name because this is not a slam against him in the least. How many of you have ever heard of Dr. David Jeremiah? He preaches in Southern California. He founded a church 25 years ago in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. 
And, and by the way, have you listened to Dr. David Jeremiah lately in the book of Revelation? You know, he got to Revelation 1.10, and you know what he said? When it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You know what he said? He said, this isn't talking about Sunday. He said, this is talking about the day of the Lord. I about fell out of my chair. So this isn't a slam on Dr. David Jeremiah, but since he's left, they've had three or four pastors there. The church has grown to 2,000 members. How many of you know uh, Dave Weinbrenner from Ohio? Dave Weinbrenner is a, just a dear, dedicated saint of God, and he shares the mystery with everyone he can find, along with the gospel. And he shared it with his nephew, Doug Weinbrenner, who attends Blackhawk Ministries in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And he came to see the word rightly divided. So he started inviting his Sunday school class, which he's not the teacher, but they have many, many adult Sunday school classes in a church that size, about 30 people. Two couples at a time. You bring them to his home Sunday evening. The first couple, the lady was blind, physically blind. And so he said, I want to share something with you, but since sister so-and-so cannot uh, read, we'll just read it to her. So he read chapter one, the first Sunday night, went through the questions. Next Sunday night, chapter two. Did that for 14 weeks, read the whole book. At the end, those two couples embraced the grace message. Next uh, 14 weeks, he invited two more couples. All right, let's do this again. He did this for a, a whole year, more than a year. And in the end, it, when it was all struck down, he's got five or six couples that have come to embrace the, the word rightly divided. And they want to start a grace church. And their lament is, as they've continued to go back and they've decided they can't continue attending uh, their church, as they go back, more and more, or I should say less and less, they're, they're not hearing the gospel. And more and more, they're getting entertainment. Right. And they're getting all kind of, anything to bring the people in. And I just, this doesn't really relate, but I just have to share this touching story. We went and had Bible studies with these folks. Every time we get near there, we go and stop through. And, and we went to the, the lady's house and her husband, the, the lady that's blind. And, and uh, she can, she's got such good other senses from having had to depend on hearing and so forth. And she, she looks right at me with her, her eyes that are, are white in the middle. And, and she just almost can see tears starting to form in them. And she said, thank you for, for writing the mystery. She says, you have opened our eyes. And I thought that means something <laughs> coming from her. <laughs> you have opened our eyes. And uh, what was I saying? Oh, the, they have determined that they just want to begin a grace church based on the preaching and teaching of the word rightly divided. And they are tired of fleshly ministry. And I just want to encourage some of you I, think you, I hope you older gentlemen realize this, but you younger pastors, please don't give in to this approach to ministry. Amen. Preach the word. Be instant, in season. You know, you can grow a church by preaching the word. I've seen it happen. Amen. It works. We had a couple come to our church out in Rockerville when we were out there yet. And uh, they came because they liked our building. Well, that's fine. And they were seeking. But they came in and... Uh, after about a month, they could see that we were teaching something a little different, and they came to see the word rightly divided. And uh, one week, uh, the husband came by and shook my hand, and he says, that was really interesting. He said, why don't more pastors use the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a revolutionary thought. You can build a church just by preaching the word. It works. It's possible. Thirdly, now here's what's going to take a little while. Believers need to be delivered from having floundering families. Believers today need to be delivered from having floundering families. Let's turn to another passage in 1 Timothy this time. Chapter 2 and verse 15. Here's one of those passages. If you take 26 commentaries, look up the verse. If they even touch on it, you will have 27 different views. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. 
Doesn't that bless your heart? <laughs> and I've heard all kinds of explanations. Well, it must be talking. It's talked about Eve in the context back there. Verse number 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman. And so it must be talking about Eve. And she'll be saved in childbearing in that she brings forth the seed of the woman. And eventually Christ is born. And so he brings out, no, no, wait. That's a little harder, I think, than it has to be. If you back up in verse number 11, it says, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. And I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. You see, when God gives this instruction about the woman learning, not teaching men, now it doesn't say she can't teach. In fact, Paul tells her that she should teach. Teach the younger women how to do certain things. But he does say they are not to teach men. And he says there's a reason for that. It's not because they're stupid. The, the women, that is. <laughs> Actually, I think women are generally brighter than men. Amen? Amen. All right. <laughs> but the reason that he gives is there is a divine order to things. Verse 13, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. That's the reason. Now, he gives another reason, too, but that one would get me in more trouble. So, there is a reason. There's a divine order. Just as God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Son, they all have their place. Can you imagine what a mess we'd be in if they wouldn't have done their roles? What if Christ had said, no, I'm not going? Huh? Aren't you glad God follows a divine order of things? Do you think maybe we should? <laughs> The church has bought in to the world. By the way, what this really means, and I'll, you know, I'll explain it and you go be a Berean and search it out. What he's saying is, look, women have a desire to teach. God, God put it in them. They have a desire to nurture and to, to help others understand. And he says, there's a way that, to deliver you from having that frustration of not having anyone to teach. Now, don't chuckle when I say this. Have a bunch of kids. Huh? She shall be saved in childbearing. What did Paul, look over here in chapter 5, verse 14. I will therefore, do you lady, young ladies want to know the will of God for your life? Huh? They're not answering. <laughs> I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give not occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. The church has bought in to the world's attitude towards children. Children are considered a bother by the world. And so as soon as you can, get them out of your house and let someone else take care of them. And get on with your career. Get on with your life. Let someone else do it. Turn back to Psalm 127. I want to try and help you understand why this is such a disaster. Psalm 127. Verse number one, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early. How many of you like that for your life verse? <laughs> to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage. You know what that means? An inheritance. How many of you like the idea of inheriting something. Huh? That's, I mean, we don't like to lose our loved ones, but it's nice to inherit something, isn't it? Imagine getting an inheritance from God. Do you think that would be a good one? Children are an heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is His reward. And the world today has turned the idea of having children into a curse rather than a blessing. And the, the church has just bought it. I went to, I had a little Bible conference in Lancaster, Wisconsin. Not Lancaster, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Lancaster, Wisconsin. And one of the family, we go there every year, and one family that keeps us, uh, there is one family that keeps us. You know, we found there are only certain kind of people that keep us when we travel. <laughs> How many are coming? <laughs> But they welcome us in, and uh, Jack is about 65 or 68 years old, I don't know, and 
we're sitting there in the living room uh, the night before the conference and just casually discussing the, the Word of God. He just, he had some questions. He said, I want to talk about the Word of God. You know where I like to go to Bible conferences? Where when you sit down and relax, they ask questions about the Word of God. <laughs> and Jack says, uh, what do you think of birth control? And I said, Jack. <laughs> Oh yeah, that was kind of a stupid question. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, he says the church is buying into abortion. And I said, what? He said, you know what I heard? And, and, and I, I affirmed it. I've heard this too. And, and scientifically, uh, this is true. Did you know that the pill not only prevents conception, is that it causes abortions once an egg has been fertilized? Did you know that? And he made this statement that he had heard from the researcher, Christian researcher, that's going to shock some of you, but he said there are more abortions taking place in our churches Sunday morning than there ever are in abortion clinics. Has the church bought into the philosophies of the world? But let's say we go ahead and welcome those children into our lives. And look what it says in verse number four. It says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his what? Quiver full of them. Now, I, wanna, I don't have much time here, and I, I hope I can get to my last point. Because my last point includes the text that comes along with my title. But... Uh, you know, when we think of arrows in a quiver, we think of going down to Walmart, getting this little canister, and buying a bunch of uh, aluminum shaft arrows with nice feathers and, and uh, razor points, right? I mean, that's, that's our mentality. How did these guys get arrows? Now, they made their own, didn't they? And uh, was that, how, what was that process like, do you suppose? They just went out and got a stick and put a notch in it and started shooting? No. They would get a piece of stone, have you ever watched someone make an arrow? I used to think that they took that piece of stone and they started hammering on it. That's not how you make an arrowhead. You take another piece of stone and you put pressure at strategic points and then it just kind of chips off like glass and you put the pressure in all the right places. And You know, this takes a while to make an arrow. Did you know that? It takes a while just to make the point properly shaped and sharp. And so that guy makes that arrow and then he, uh, he's got to find a, a straight piece, right? A stick, and if it's not perfectly straight, he's got to whittle on it and get it you know, straight. And he's got to find the right kind of feathers and, and get them fastened and get everything bound on. The point is, arrows take some time to prepare. And let's apply this uh, in, in just some very practical ways. Let's say that uh, you're going to go to war. I'm trying to picture this in your mind. You've got the two sides, and I don't know if they fought in old days like at the Civil War or Revolutionary War where they'd line up in two lines and just start blasting away. <laughs> but uh, they, let's say they only have bows and arrows. Okay? And so your side is on, the, on, let's say, on the north side, and, and the other side is on the south side, and you're, you're there shooting away with your arrows. And you start looking around, and you start noticing that your men are, are beginning to, to take hits, and they're beginning to fall, but nobody over there is, is falling. Okay? What might be the problem? Think about it. Uh, your arrows might be faulty. All right? They might be defective. Now, what would be the solution to this problem? Let's get out a white flag, okay? And let's call it truce. Let's stop and let's figure this thing out. So let's stop. Everybody stop shooting, okay? So let's say you can convince your enemy to stop shooting at you. Get your white flag out. And you say, hey, we've noticed that your arrows fly truer than our arrows. Could we send some of our arrows over to you and have you fix them? Would that be a good idea? Okay, now, why wouldn't that be a good idea? They'll send them back. <laughs> okay, they might send them back. But let's say, do you think, what are some other options? What else might they do with your arrows? They might just keep them. They might sabotage them. They might put a little bit of a crick in there, and they might put the feathers on wrong, and they might change that point a little bit to take off that edge. And they then might return them to you. Okay? Have we bought into the world's philosophy? 
Why do we as Christian parents... Now see, here's where I'm going to get in trouble. My time's almost up. I'm almost ready to pack up. <laughs> Why do we take our arrows and send them to the enemy and say, here, you get our arrows ready for us. Why do we do that? And then when our children start hurting us, why are we scratching our head? And we're saying, oh, where did I go wrong? Where did I go wrong? Well, I'll tell you where you went wrong. You know, the book of Proverbs says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, I've had more people tell me, that just doesn't always work. It just doesn't always work. And I'm here to tell you today, it does work. Our problem is that we did not train up our children in the way they should go. That is our problem. Have our churches bought into it? I had a church board once. That was back when we only had uh, three kids. And Linda was expecting and I was sharing the happy news with our board. And one of the board members said, how many of these children are you going to have? And I'm thinking, what is it about my children that you don't like? I didn't say that. My children are not perfect. Believe me. But they're not so bad, are they? Huh? <laughs> Don't you wish there were more like that? There should be more children like that, not less. But that's what I heard from my board. That was not too long. We've, well, I won't say anymore about that. <laughs> Why are we letting the enemy prepare our arrows? And then we wonder what's wrong with our evangelism. <coughs> Mom and Dad, God has given you those children as a sacred trust. Please do not hire others to raise them. Please do not hire others. What did Christ say about the hireling? Hmm? You don't know the book of John very well, do you? The hireling careth not for the sheep. Doesn't care for them. Well, my time is up and I didn't get finished. And I think the others have covered the last point sufficiently. But I just want to, in, the, in these few moments, just, uh, just for you to meditate. Have you adopted the world's philosophy towards children? Think it through. What could our evangelism be like if those arrows were all true Amen. Amen. and going out with a purpose? Let's pray. Father. We thank you for your word and the clear direction that it gives us. And Father, we just you know, we do thank you for this conference that is challenging each and every one of us. And Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to, to be edified and built up and then sent back out into the fray. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.